Hello, everybody. Welcome to The Political Vigilante. My name is Graham Elwood. We are joined by returning uh, guest, uh, Christy I, and I hate to say former co-host of Boom Bus because it was a show that I really like watching. But uh, in addition to many shows, RT America was shut down. Uh, Lee Camp, my friend and co-host on Government Secrets, has a theory that th the Department of Justice leaned on RT America. So, Christy, first, before we get into like Bitcoin and crypto, which you're very knowledgeable on, can you tell us what you think or what you know happened as to why RT America got shut down? Yeah, I think uh, what Lee Camp was saying has uh, it's actually quite accurate. But then the other half of the story was also the big monetization aspect of it, because as a business, they make a big portion of their revenue through ads. And so what happened was DirecTV pulled their station. So RT America was shut down from DirecTV, from um, YouTube, from the Apple App Store. So they had their portable TV app on the Apple App Store. And that was also pulled out as well. So really, after all of those platforms basically delisted RT America, the only platform that didn't delist them was actually Pluto TV. So that was really unfortunate. But because of that, there was simply just no ad revenue. They were burning cash on the daily. As you can imagine, the studio out in D.C. where I used to host at, um, they staffed over 150 people in that office. And all of them have paychecks and all of them have lives. And it was a very expensive operation. And not to mention the equipment, broadcasting, all the satellite, the satellite times, the advertisers. So once the advertisers pulled, once DirecTV pulled and all that, once Roku pulled as well, we were also distributed on Roku TV. They pulled out as well. So literally Pluto TV was the only one left standing. And that was simply not enough to sustain the entire business. So uh, RT America announced that they were shutting down operations immediately that week. We all got notified on the Thursday or the Friday of none of us really knew what was happening because there was it was just a very big expensive cash burn so the hope is there is a little rumor mill churning that uh there might potentially be a revival but again that is a rumor mill and that is something to be uh seen in the future mm, well i hope it comes back but yeah i, I do know I, I remember uh ron placone and i were touring on the East Coast, I think it was 2019, and we were in DC, and we were both on Redacted tonight with Lee, and so we were at those studios, and yeah, it's a, it was a nice professional TV studio facility. So I understand there's a huge overhead, yeah. and the thing that's so that's so bad that, that's so troublesome to me is how can we sit there as Americans and say we have a free society? A cornerstone of a free society is a free pr is free press, and so what this is like, we're not allowed to have any dissenting views. I watch the Western media's reporting on Russia and Ukraine, and it is so one-sided, not making excuses for anything Putin yeah. and the Russians are doing, but there's, we're not allowed to even like hear a different point of view or talk about, we're not allowed to even these long interviews that are done with Putin where he's saying, yeah. you know, and he's been saying this for years of like, we don't want NATO in Ukraine. We don't want NATO moving West. We don't want missiles in Ukraine all things. And there's this interview he did last month where he was like, and again, I had to go searching for it on the online. I think it was through RT Nat international mm -hmm. where he's like, can you imagine if we had Russian bases in Canada, Americans would go nuts. Exactly. But it's also like, why should we be surprised? Because as you mentioned, you got demonetized simply for speaking against the mainstream grain. And also not to mention that even before all of this, when COVID happened, when the trade war happened, when there was dissenting opinions in China regarding the Hong Kong riots and everything, all of that was simply blocked out. So we don't hear any of that in Western mainstream media. If you have any sort of dissenting opinion these days, and I think this is a very dangerous path for Americans to be on. There was actually something I read a couple of days ago being like Yale law students. And these are law students. So these are people who are trained to question materials and question the facts and validity of it, that these law students were getting so into these their opinionated facts that they would not hear a dissenting opinion. And when they hear a dissenting opinion, these law students just started booing the guest lecturer and calling the guest lecturer out, being like, you woke B word and all of that. And these are Yale law students, so they're supposed to be very professional and everything. They're supposed to have an inquisitive mind, question the facts and question the validity, but like they wouldn't even hear another side of the same story. They wouldn't hear a dissenting opinion because of this entire woke movement and cancel culture that having any sort of dissenting opinion, you get canceled because it's not popular. 
Yeah, it is really, it is really dangerous. And it, and and in the same breath, they're like, oh, the you know the Russian media is not telling the Russian citizens the truth. Okay, that's maybe true. I don't know, could be. But then we do the same thing. Like it's it's, it's I, I can't. And I've done so many videos on this. I've posted this on social media. And I've some, in some ways, I've done it sort of like joking sarcastically, like I stand with Ukraine, but, you know, Yemen, Syria, Afghanistan, Palestine, them I can't stand for because I got a bad back. Like the, 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 the hypocrisy of this, I mean, okay, Putin is bombing innocent people and they're showing all this footage out of Ukraine and it's awful and I'm against war. I'm against war. So I'm against any war from anybody. But then like- the American politicians in both parties and the American media, like, do they not have the internet? Have they, can they not look up what the U S has done in the middle East in the last 20 years? We're talking like anywhere from, I've heard numbers as 4 million on up to 10, 11 million people have died from the global war on terror that the U S has pushed and funded. Like, exactly. Exactly. But they don't push it in mainstream media because that's not part of the U.S. agenda right now. Right now, part of this U.S. agenda, this is an extended agenda, is this entire fear of power rising in the East. And this goes hand in hand with a couple of years ago when we were here talking about uh, China's rising power and everything. And so if you think about it, it literally is a difference in philosophical views. They are grouping Russia and China into this little big broad stroke communist bucket that they view as a threat to the Western democratic, Western democracy way of life. And so because of that, they're making this such a big point. And that's why Russia is the big enemy. And because they're attacking Ukraine, this is the big focal point. But yes, you're absolutely right. Any of the other wars that the US have has waged in the Middle East, no, they weren't significant because it was not against a world power. It was not against anyone that was really a threat to the American way of life. Yeah. And by American way of life, I mean, let's be real clear what that is. It's actually American corporations. I mean, it's the, it's the oil companies. They don't want Russia. I mean, they literally said it, and this is a couple of months ago before the Russian invasion, there, there was, they basically said, we don't want this pipeline between Russia and Germany. We're, we want Western Europe to buy American natural gas and oil and it's more expensive <laughs> so oh, it's yes. just like absolutely yes americans just trying to dictate their business and economics all over we don't care if it's good for germany if it's cheaper if it makes economical sense for germany to do anything no we just want them to do whatever we want them to do and control it because we want our friends to only only be on our side and not potentially have other allies that are dependent elsewhere. And that is essentially what the U.S. fears the most. And it's really unfortunate that they don't take a step back and see that they're actually kind of being the big bullies. They're accusing China of unfair trade practices. Like, I don't know what how how this can be classified as fair. You are you need to buy more expensive oil from the U.S., not with your other trading partner, Russia, even though it's cheaper, you need to sacrifice your business ethics and everything, business acumen, and buy more expensive product for your citizens. Why? That's considered fair trade practice? Yeah. And it's like, it's so funny. And I'm, I'm sure you've covered this. I've, I've covered it too on this show. Uh, is like any, well, well, Russia, you know, and China got off of the petrodollar and they, they, they use their own currency now, I believe. And, and didn't they, didn't China start using the petro yuan? Like, yeah. So they're trying, they're trying to, they've been testing the digital RMB through their system and to trade oil. Um, and that's something that is actually gaining a lot of traction. So both China and the Russia, they've started to go um, to not use the U S dollar as much. And I think that one, it was because they knew that sanctions they were coming. They were coming down eventually. And in the end, they were going to be forced to choose what currency to use. And if sanctions actually did come, if they were banned from the SWIFT network, then they have to be ready for something else. And China and Russia, they've had over 50 years to figure out what that other option is. And right now, unfortunately, US dollar is the dollar reserve right now. And it's still a very powerful reserve. The only reason being is that there is no secondary competitor right now. There is no secondary currency that is as powerful as widely distributed currently as the US dollar. The RMB is rising up to be a major challenger, but I don't think it is quite there yet. They're still testing it. They're still doing very limited volumes. The RMB is still, um, it's a lot more volatile compared to the US dollar. But I do say that the US dollar is in a very precarious place. And I never thought in my lifetime that we'd be witnessing something like this because 
how I see it, it's almost like the fall of a giant because we're on the precipice of the downfall of the US dollar. Not saying it's going to happen like now or in the next 50 years, but I think we really are seeing the cracks right now because the US dollar is supposed to be this big international currency. And an international currency is supposed to be neutral. But now Washington is just completely changing to the rules. So if Washington doesn't like you, they can put sanctions on you and then you can't use the US dollar. So if that happens, many countries, they're going to start looking for a competitor. Because if you're a country and having this threat loom over you, that's literally like a sword hanging above your neck. So countries right now, like China, Russia, India, and Brazil, they're all looking for competing currencies or payment networks because Washington doesn't play fair anymore. And if Washington doesn't think Europe is looking at other currency, then they're just fooling themselves because it's not like Europe and Washington, they're friends right now. But who knows, 50, 60, 80 years later, if that's still going to be true. So they're still going to be looking for other options because Washington has shown their face now. And Russia, they currently have about 16% of their reserves in the US dollar. 32% in the euros. So that's basically 50% of their reserves in currencies that are controlled by people who are cutting them off. So while their own currency right now isn't an option, other things like the RMB, they're starting to look increasingly like a viable option. Wow. I did not know that they have that much in US dollar and euros in their reserve. That's insane. I mean, and that, that it, it, it's funny because it reminds me of something when you were on this show, I think the first time it was the summer of 2020. And you talked about a lot of companies. You said at that, that in that time that they were shorting the dollar and you were like, it's not looking good for the U S economy. And I've, I mean, I having you on the show several times and I had Max Kaiser and, and his wife on the show and they were talking about, you know, all this money printing that has happened during all the stimulus and America is really it, in, uh, in, it's, in, it, in all of its bullying, especially the last four decades, in the, well, the last two decades of, of the bullying with regard to the you know, global war on terror and anyone that gets off the petrodollar, boy, they get one between the eyes, man. Gaddafi, Saddam, not that those guys were good dudes, but like anytime somebody gets off the petrodollar, we go to war with them or we sanction them. Mm -hmm. and, my, and, and what we're seeing now, and I, I want to hear your input on this because according to the American media, uh, Russia is isolated and the whole world stands against them. It's like, well, if you look at a map, you've got a billion and a half Chinese there, there are a billion people in India. So if like Russia, China, and India are all like forming an alliance. You're starting to even get, I mean, all these middle Eastern countries are just waiting to do business with somebody else because we basically destroyed their countries and killed mm -hmm. people and bombed the shit out of them. It feels like, America, I mean, is really this, this doubling down we're trying and, and the military defense industry, which spent $49 million on campaigns in 2020, 2.7 million to Trump, 3.1 million to Biden. So we were going to war with Russia regardless. Um, in my opinion, they, you know, the, the defense industry wants to send all this weaponry and that, you know, the defense industry just profits from war. So as I'm seeing this, like from a global sort of how this is going to play out like a, from a chess match standpoint. And, and, and I want to hear what you have to say financially is America really like painting themselves into a corner where the whole world and, and Russia and, and these big powerhouses of Russia, China, and like India, which is a becoming an emerging market are just going to go no. And they're going to, and then America is going to be isolated financially like, do you see this happening or, or like, how, how, how do you read all this in terms of the his, what's going to happen? Increasingly, that looks like it's going to happen. And not just because Russia and China and Ukraine and India, they're forming this, as you say, alliance. It's not really an alliance. It's more so it's it's quid pro quo. You benefit me. I benefit you. We trade with each other. We benefit each other. We make each other our own countries better because I think we are we've spent about 20 years dealing with uh interglobalization every every single market is becoming more and more interconnected but we had this switch happen in around 2018 2019 time period where every single country started becoming like no it's it's america first it's china first it's russia first like every single country started doing that and every single country began to be more isolationist so when i say like russia china and india they're starting to form an alliance it's more so that their positions benefit themselves. That That's about it. It's not like they're buddy buddies. They share some sort of same ideology or anything. It's literally like 
their what Russia offers will benefit their economy. India and China are two of the biggest emerging markets. They are going to need fuel up until 2025, 2026. And they're going to be consuming massive amounts of oil, natural gas resources, because they are still growing. And they have growing industries, and they need that, and they want cheap oil. So all of this just goes to benefit them. And the US, yes, their policies, they are trying to control Europe. That is more and more starting to go like, no, we're not going to listen to you anymore because you don't have that much to offer us. Germany, it's like we get all of our resources from Russia. We are very self-sustainable. We don't need that much from you. What can you offer? Intelligence, military spending, all of that. Like that was great before, but you really can't offer us that much anymore. And so when every single country starts turning inward and looking at themselves rather than, hey, let's grow a big global marketplace, the mentality starts to shift. And every single country is like, well, how does this benefit me? And it starts becoming more selfish and inward looking. And that all started with America. That all started with the entire America first kind of campaign. That's how I, I see it. And I think with the current administration right now, the current administration is not an America first administration. It's also not a trade policy forward administration either. They are less interested in building trade, building interconnectedness between the countries. You really don't see Biden making that many visits, that many trade policy calls, that, that much effort in forming trade relations, even though the U.S. needs it. Instead, he's focusing internally on labor unions, on building the infrastructure of America, build America better, which is all well and good. But that's also focusing inward domestically rather and that's also promoting how America is going to be self isolated in the near future because this administration is almost self isolating America in their policies by not paying attention to the outer world. Mm. Yeah, it's, it's very interesting. And I, I um, it's, it's really these countries, like you say, well before even COVID, like 2018, 2019, I, I saw, you know, I was, I think it was the beginning of 2019 or maybe even 2020 when all these central Asian countries, Russia, Pakistan, Kazakhstan, all decided to, they used to, it, when they would buy and sell just, you know, commercial physical goods amongst each other, they would use the dollar and they got rid of the dollar for that. Now they're using their own currencies just for whatever, buying and selling products that they're, that either country makes and sells across the border, which is like, man, everyone is steering away from this. And even countries that are supposedly American allies, I think the whole world is like the countries that have had, they've been, we sort of forced them to be our allies. You know, we're just the big bully in the world. And, and I, the, the most of the world is going to be like, there's not going to be any love lost if America goes belly up financially. I mean, I, I don't, the people are just like, you guys have been pushing everybody around for decades. We're sick of it. So Exactly. And that's why sanctions and, and control, having control of the currency, it's really a double edged sword. Because yes, you can force people to do your bidding, you can bully other countries around. But other countries, eventually, the power dynamic is going to shift. No one country in the entire history of the world has ever been on top for forever. So every other country is going to get their turn. And so if you are known to use your currency as power to threaten and push other countries around, of course, they're going to look for alternatives. Of course, they're going to look for RMBs and building their own SWIFT network, or even turning to something like cryptocurrencies and stuff like that, and building trade in amongst themselves, where they know that they cannot be threatened. Um, hello, everybody. You're watching The Political Vigilante. Um, thanks for tuning in. Please like, uh, share, and subscribe this video. We're joined by Christy I. Uh, was the former host, a uh, co-host of Boom Bust, uh, but unfortunately, RT America got shut down, and we've been discussing how, um, you know, we've been talking about censorship, and we've been talking about how, you know, with all these sanctions, Russia and China are starting to form a financial alliance. Even India is joining in that. But I wanted to ask you this question because we, we've had you on the show in the past to talk about crypto and 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 Bitcoin, and we're seeing in real time what crypto can do. I mean, you like a lot of donations have flooded into Ukraine uh, via crypto. And, and it, it sounds like, I think last week or early this week, Zelensky said that we're going to start, you know, using crypto. Um, when the sanctions first hit Russia, when Russia first invaded, there was something in the neighborhood of $1.5 billion in rubles that went into Bitcoin. 
because mm -hmm. Russian the, the, we've, the sanctions have really hurt the ruble. And, and so I want to ask your opinion and um, what, how do you see this Russia Ukraine conflict and America, you know, really <laughs> trying to sanction it? And it's something I wanted to add before, before you, because I'm sure you're aware of this, you know, Joe Biden said, I think in December, Oh, Bitcoin limits America's ability to sanction countries. It's like, yeah, dude, that's why they created it. <laughs> like, so that's the, that's a good thing, Joe. Um, mm -hmm. I keep waiting for Russia to just make Bitcoin its reserve, its currency. Like, so, so how do you, I mean, how have you seen Bitcoin influence the Russia Ukraine thing? And also the price of Bitcoin has been, has been definitely kind of uh, a little volatile in this last month of this, uh, horrible war. So, so how do you see it? Bitcoin involved in, in this and, and w do you think Russia will make it its, its currency? I mean, this is a very complicated subject because obviously in the short term, there is a big bear case scenario as the crypto market, there is enough institutionals that right now the crypto markets, the big Bitcoin and ETH, they're kind of correlated with the S and P and all of that tanked a little bit on the, on the macro uncertainty and all that. So there's about a 70% correlation to equities right now, which is unfortunate because Bitcoin was previously seen as this asymmetric hedge to equities. But that is proving to be not the case. But that's not the whole story, because while Bitcoin and ETH fell with the broader S&P because of the institutional participation, a lot of the altcoins, though, they actually still retained their value. And some even had massive rallies. So you had Luna, for example, Anchor, FTX, just to name a few. And these are altcoins that are still pure and they haven't been tainted by the traditional institutionals who dump at the first sign of trouble. And so these are still held largely by the founders, the diamond hands of crypto communities who believe in the long term potential of these projects. So that's the first thing I'd like to point out. All the cryptos, they're not the same. And there are divergences happening between Bitcoin ETH and then all the altcoins and even between Bitcoin and ETH itself. They all have their own stories. And really, it'd be a flawed market. if Everything was completely correlated to one another. So that's absolutely not the case here. And then the second thing is, as you mentioned, how the war relates to crypto. And what we keep on hearing right now is that how crypto will play a role in avoiding sanctions. So economic sanctions, they barred the Russian institutions from global financial and payments markets. They're costing the country billions of dollars every single day. So initially, when sanctions came down on Russia, Bitcoin and the entire space, they took a huge leg higher that day on the assumption that Russia would just turn to crypto to evade these sanctions. But... Because after all, the underlying purpose of this technology is to allow individuals and institutions to transact without the need for either dollars, euros, or any fiat currencies or their incumbent financial institution. So this was great for crypto. This was kind of a real world testing lab of how this asset that was made specifically for this time of crisis would perform. So currently, the media and all the politicians, they're basically being very big drama queens about crypto. They're spending a lot of time and effort and focus on crypto and sanctions. But the real truth is, at the current rate, crypto is too small for Russia. Because if we look at crypto adoption today, it's probably about 3% of the global populations with, who have some kind of crypto exposure. And of those, most only have a small percentage of their net wealth in crypto, like 10%, for example. So that's less than 0.3% of the global net wealth in crypto today. And this percentage applies equally to Russia. And so the question of how's Russia going to evade sanctions with crypto, the market cap of Bitcoin, which is the largest coin, is only 800 billion. Meanwhile, the GDP of Russia is 1.5 trillion. So then even when people say, oh, the privacy coins, the dot are coins, they're used for nefarious reasons to get around these sanctions and hackers and everything. It's like, no. Monero, Zcash, Dash. Now, the market cap of XMR, it's only $3 billion. So that's not even a drop in the bucket for Russia's oil trade. So all of this fear mongering about cryptos being bad because if it falls outside of the purview and control of the government, it's really not based on facts. That's just fear mongering of the idea of crypto and how they're trying to paint crypto as this bad thing. But on the other side, they're like, oh, yay, crypto, donations for Ukraine. Crypto's great for Ukraine. It's like crypto is a tool. It's a neutral tool, kind of like a handgun. 
use a handgun for defense. It can also be used for murder. It's a tool and it depends on how you want to use it. You can't just say, oh, crypto is terrible. It's allowing Russia to evade sanctions. It's for hackers and all of this stuff, child trafficking and everything. But then on the other hand, you love crypto because, oh, you make all these donations to Ukraine. You feel really good about yourself, like hashtag, like Ukraine and everything. Like people feel great about donating to Ukraine and crypto. And it's total hypocrisy. So, yeah, it's, 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 those, those are all great points. And, uh, and that, that's why I love having you on the show because you talk about the market cap, something that, you know, I don't pay that close attention to, but it is very, very important in this. And, and I mean, because we've seen like, we've seen what's happened in El Salvador, which is like amazing what, what has happened to El Salvador. And when that happened last summer, I was like, oh man, it's going to be, this is a domino effect. And I'm, was kind of waiting for countries that have been had to take the brunt end of American sanctions like Venezuela, like Cuba. And wouldn't they just look at El Salvador and go, okay, let's, let's do this. Let's go to crypto. Um, and it feels like this is a prime spot for, uh, Russia to do it, um, in terms of what they're doing. And so, so, so I don't know, I, I again, yeah. What, what, what do you think is, what do you think uh, aside from some of the, I mean, you listed a lot of great reasons, but what else do you think is maybe holding them back? Or do you think there's going to, is, will there be some like change? Cause here's the thing too, uh, you know, Putin kind of was like, it didn't seem like I even did videos. Like, I don't think there's going to be an invasion. And then I was shocked that he just did that. And he just, cause something pissed him off. It might've been Zelensky saying, you know what, I'm going to bring weapon, you know, missiles into Ukraine and the next day. Um, so I don't know. Like with all these other countries starting to adopt it and with, you know, like Miami using it, you know, I mean, I just like, it feels like this is the, this is the moment where the, it could happen. I don't know. Absolutely. Adoption is definitely around the corner. And Putin actually came on um, a couple months before he even invaded Ukraine saying that uh, Bitcoin is now analogous to the Russian ruble analogous, which means that it could be used as legal tender, but it's not ready for being full on oil trade yet. So I do think that they are slowly adopting it in incremental spaces. But so I think right now crypto is great. It's great for all of the refugees in Ukraine who need to pack up and leave because Bitcoin is a global currency. You can use it anywhere you go. You can use it in Europe, in Germany, in Poland, wherever they end up. Um, but it's also great for Russian families who are literally stuck because I heard I'd heard of a lot of Russians. They were actually on vacation when all of this happened. They were in Europe. They were in Bali. They were somewhere else. And then all of a sudden, Visa and MasterCard froze, froze all of their accounts and they weren't allowed to use it. So they were essentially broke and stranded in Bali, Europe, wherever they were, and couldn't have any money for hotels, for food, even a flight to get back because their Visa and MasterCards wouldn't work. And obviously, you know, European country is going to take any ruble. So you have all of these Russians that are also stuck in limbo as well. So I think that right now, while it's still too early for cryptocurrency to actually help a country to evade sanction, it is very good for individual families. It's even good for, say, Russian oligarchs who even want to protect their wealth and everything like that. High net wealth, uh, individual investors, individual traders and everything like that. Bitcoin has certainly been a huge asset for them in the recent days. There have been huge inflows into all of these crypto funds, crypto startups, and all of these uh, people who are just trying to get all their assets into something that is um, that is censorship resistant and cannot be seized. So that has been a great boom for Bitcoin. And right now, Ukrainian government, they've been soliciting donations in crypto. They've raised over $50 million as of March 11th. And to me, war always has collateral damages. But right now, crypto is just playing an important role in allowing all of these non-combatants on both sides to continue to have access to a financial lifeline. And so that's what I think will start to kick off this entire crypto revolution. It always starts with the individual. It doesn't start from up top at the government saying that, oh, we're going to use crypto for oil trading. No, it's not going to be like that. Crypto, it's always going to start with the grassroots, with the individuals, for the people who need that access to capital and access to finance. Yeah. And, and one of the things I saw, one of the crypto shows I watched said one of the reasons why sort of Bitcoin spiked a little bit right after the invasion, but it's been kind of moving sideways is because people like in Russia and Ukraine, they're not buying, getting Bitcoin and holding it. They're using it to pay for stuff. So there, there, there's a lot of buying and selling. Um, 
and you know, kind of feels like 45,000 is sort of the, uh, the level we'll see if it breaks past 45,000, then is it going to take off past that? Or is it going to just keep kind of bouncing up and down? Um, but I wanted to talk to you also about this because, you know, the EU was thankfully this bill didn't pass uh, <laughs> um, that was really kind of anti crypto. And then Biden has been talking about, you know, they're, they're trying to pass all this crypto legislation in the U.S. How do you what are your opinions on this, this crypto pending crypto legislation and regulation in the U.S. in general and other major uh, countries? How? how how do you view these potential crypto regula regulatory bills that are up for, you know, bidding, being passed? And how do you think it'll affect uh, the price of crypto, specifically Bitcoin? Well, I'm not a huge fan of regulation, as you know. So this current executive order, I actually couldn't be happier with it because this order was supposedly touted as being this big overarching order that will uh, reestablish this entire industry and everything. So that, those were the rumors. And that's why Bitcoin was kind of sluggish for the couple of days going into it because we really didn't know what would be in it. But essentially when it was revealed, it wasn't really all that monumental. It literally just spelled out all the things that the industry knew was coming. Things like uh, its priorities were to protect American consumers, investors, businesses, to protect their financial stability, uh, mitigate illicit financing, promote technological leadership and all of that. So it was very self-explanatory broad strokes on regulating crypto. So I think that's perfect. It leaves a lot of room for the industry to continue to grow and evolve. So overall, this was a net positive for the industry. The main concern prior to this was that um, this EO might force rulemaking or impose new bad restrictions on crypto. But fortunately, it's nothing like that here for the time being. So it was as good as it could get. The big positive takeaway was that this is evidence that crypto is not going to fade out like a fad that a lot of people thought it would. And, it, and a lot of people thought that the U.S. could even ban crypto. So this shows that crypto is here to stay, it's here to stay in the U.S. and all of that. So and it was a big step for the industry because this EO acknowledged the need for evolution and alignment of the government's approach to crypto. So when they get into more specifics later on down the road, I'm sure the industry won't be too happy about that, um, especially with the fact that a lot of burden now falls on the companies, like the exchanges, the Coinbase's, the Robinhoods and all of that to do all their KYC, due diligence and everything. And the exchanges could be fined for the wrongdoings of individuals. So the government's kind of putting pushing that burden onto private companies. Um, and of course, this is being heavily debated um, because the industry says this cannot fly. And even if it does, then everybody's just going to move to DeFi, decentralized financing platforms anyway, instead of these centralized platforms. So it's really not going to work. So with the current state of things, it's kind of like the status quo. Nothing has really changed, which has kind of been the tune for the last, I want to say five, six years. I don't want to jinx myself, but for the last five, six years, everybody was saying regulations coming, like doomsday is coming. Everything's going to be bad later on. Um, but so far, luckily, like knock on wood, it hasn't. Yeah. So it's, it's really, um, yeah, it's, 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 I like how you explain that. That's, that's, um, that makes a lot of sense. So, uh, you know, a lot of, a lot of, um, crypto people were saying, you know, Bitcoin was going to be at a hundred grand by the end of 2021 and Ethereum was going to be close to 10 grand. And obviously that didn't happen. And some people are saying that that could still happen. It's, uh, again, this year, um, so, I mean, do you see that happening? I know like what's happening in Ukraine is it's just a complete curveball into the whole, all of this um, and all of this potential regulation. And, you know, like all there's a lot of there's way more variables, it seems like, in the in the crypto space than before, because when all the institutional money came in and Bitcoin went from 10 grand to 30 to 40 to 50 thousand or whatever, then all of a sudden everyone starts paying attention and it's changing that. So how do you see just Bitcoin in general? Do you see it getting breaking its all-time high at some point this year? Do you see it making $100,000 before the end of the year? That's going to be a very difficult prediction because all of it is literally based on the supply and, di supply and demand dynamics of Bitcoin, which is going to be quite difficult because we do have the halving coming up and that's going to be 
And every so every single four years, you have Bitcoin halving, and that decreases the supply because then you have the amount of Bitcoin that is rewarded and mined every single block. So that was actually one of the big boosts that kickstarted this entire rally that we saw last year and the year before for Bitcoin. We had the halving. So we do still need another halving for Bitcoin to have probably another boost of momentum. So this year, I think it's going to be kind of choppy. It might hit the all time highs again. It might be difficult to break that $100,000 mark. But really, that's just a that's just a, a psychological benchmark that everybody has set for Bitcoin. I think what's more important for the industry is the constant evolution and the growth of the entire platform. So Bitcoin and ETH, they're really gateway coins for the entire industry for everything else that is developing so one of the biggest themes that we're seeing right now is development of the metaverse so you hear about everybody collecting these nfts snoop dogg being in the metaverse you now have hsbc purchasing real estate in the sandbox and stuff like that so that is that is actually real development real change um assets that you can own in the metaverse that you actually own outside of the metaverse what i mean by that is um like someone bought one of these uh board ape yacht club nfts and because you own that you own everything about that image which means that they then took that image and they put it on their store so their store front is now their ape because they own everything so you know, normally copyright laws and everything like if you own a you own a Harry Potter book that doesn't mean you can put your Harry Potter and be put it on a store and be like I'm this Harry Potter store like no but with NFTs it's pure ownership you own this NFT you own the entire copyright you own everything so you can take your NFT ape and put it on your store and that's what it means it's real real physical ownership and that's what's so exciting about this entire industry and what's going to be a really groundbreaking for this entire movement so I think the metaverse is going to be huge. The entire decentralized financing, it's going to be huge because that is how a lot of um, pools now have liquidity. And then I also think cross-chaining is going to be another huge theme right now. Cross-chaining is essentially when you're linking things between chains, because obviously you have your Bitcoin chain, you have your ERC-20 chain that Ethereum and everything else trades on. And then now you have the new Terra chain, you have Phantom chain, and all these chains, they're all trying to be faster, more efficient, more secure, uh, more accessible and easier to build decentralized apps on and everything. So that's real technology behind everything. So I think it's going to be the entire growth of the space as a whole that's going to push one, the individual assets up, but also the market cap of Bitcoin as well. Mm, yeah, that's interesting. Yeah, the NFT thing is so intriguing to me just as, a, as an entertainer who you know, I, I've got some movies that I directed that I got distribution for and they're on Amazon. And I, you know, it's, it's like, oh, it's not doing well. I don't know. Amazon could be lying. The movie could have a thousand, you know, a million downloads and I, and they're just hiding it from me. Whereas an NFT, I, you know, anytime somebody, you know, I can sell it. Anytime somebody else sells it, I get a piece of it. It's on the, it's on the blockchain. I can see it. I can, exactly. there's no like dispute. Exactly. Yeah. It's fair compensation for the artist and the creator. Yes, that's such a great, succinct way to put it. It is fair compensation for the artist and the creator. And so I'm, I'm, you know, working with Rockfin about putting an NFT out there for this political game show I've been doing, um, you know, and raising money for it. They're going to, they're, they're coming up with some really interesting models for like taking NFTs and using them as crowdfunding for content, which I've had some success with crowdfunding in the past, but this just seems like the next level of it. It's really, really exciting. So, um, uh, before you go, uh, what any any altcoins you're excited about? Uh, I'm really excited about Luna, as I mentioned, Luna that trades on the Terra network and also Anchor. Um, so those are two that I've been following. Phantom as well, simply because I'm really sick and tired of paying all those high fees on the wow. ETH chain. Like ETH is amazing. It's the most secure. It's the most scalable. There's so many apps on it. ETH is amazing. I love ETH. However, the fees, they just kind of kill me. The gas fees and everything, like when the chain is congested, it's like $30, $40 and everything. So in that respect, like Luna was a great option. Phantom is another option um, and things like that. Uh, I also love cha uh, Link, Chainlink, again, for the cross-chaining abilities. Ren is also amazing. Ren has not taken off yet, but I have high expectations of it simply because if most applications are on an ERC-20 chain, people will need to put Bitcoin on ERC-20 eventually. So I have high expectations for Ren. Kind of hasn't performed yet, but I have an eye out on them right now. And I think any of the level one stuff, so Avalanche, 
it's also a really good one as well. Awesome. Well, thank you for all that. That's a uh, good food for thought. Well, um, I, Chrissy, I don't, I don't know what you're doing now. Um, now that RT got shut down, my suggestion, and maybe you've already thought of this, you should be doing your own financial show and you should be doing your own financial YouTube show and you should do it. And you should put a show on Rockfin, which is blockchain cryptocurrency. They pay us in all the content creators in their own Ray token that they mine. And then we convert it to ETH. So I'm very familiar with the pain in the ass of the gas fees because <laughs> I have to go through that every month. But uh, it's just something to think about. Lee Camp's on there. Abby Martin's on there. You should be doing your own because you have a wealth of knowledge. And it, you know, uh, if you want me to, we can talk after and I can put you in touch with the people at Rockman because you, you would be a, a welcome voice and you'd be getting paid in crypto. And so it's, they don't censor, there's no ads, it's blockchain and they pay us in crypto. Anyway, that's my little pitch because I think you should be doing your own show, man. Cause you're, you're awesome. Absolutely. I will say there is something in the works. Oh, snap. <laughs> I knew it. Nice. <laughs> nice. Well, um, all right. Where can people follow you? So the, when you ever announce whatever this thing in the works is happening, they can start following it. Uh, you can find me on Instagram. My hashtag is uh, at Chris Dye underscore AI. Okay, cool. Kate, okay, can you put that up? Um, and I'll put that on the screen. Um, uh, Christy, thank you so much for taking time out. Again, I'm sorry about RT America, but I'm, 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 I'm happy to hear you got stuff in the works and we really appreciate you taking the time out uh, to talk with us today. Absolutely. I'd love to see you in LA. <laughs> yes. Yes. Uh, when I'm, I'll, I'll let you know when I, I might be doing a show there, uh, the end of the end of the end of April. So I'll let you know. All right. Sounds good. Sounds like a good All right, Chrissy, Have a great weekend. Thank you so much. Great All seeing right. you. Thank you. Bye-bye. Bye. Hey everybody. Thanks for watching. We are still in our like ninth month of demonetization from YouTube. So support what we're doing at patreon.com slash Graham Elwood or rockfin.com slash Graham Elwood, which is a blockchain cryptocurrency platform. It's free to sign up and there's a premium level at $10 a month. And for that, you get everybody on the platform's premium content. Myself, Lee Camp, Ron Placone, Jimmy Dore, Whitney Webb, Kim Iverson, Abby Martin, and many, many others. You can also support what we're doing at Venmo at Graham Elwood and go to GrahamElwood.com. We have a PayPal button and a PO box. I also have crypto wallets, which are all in the show notes. Thanks for supporting what we do.